construct. Recorded? Yeah, I think, I think we're recording it. Yeah. Okay, so what are we talking about? We're still, of course, in a portion of Noah. We're just about to begin. Thank you, everyone, for joining again. Noah, um, chapter six and chapter seven, that's where we're really up to. But just by way of introduction, because it's uh, Sunday morning, so you want to think about the story of the flood and really what the Torah is telling us. And one way to think about it is by comparing it to the other cultures. And they discovered in the 19th century, they find writings from from um, Babylonia, Iraq, and many ancient cultures in the, in the Middle East, the Near East. And basically what they discover is that virtually everybody has a flood story. Am I right about that, right? Everybody has a flood story and everybody has somebody being saved miraculously. And that seems to be saying that the concept of a flood story is very common. And for some reason, this is maybe because of the topography, um, there's desert, so deserts, you can get flash storms, who knows why, but that's the fact that it's a common theme in many, um, in many, in many cultures in the area at the time. But once you start looking at the details and the scholars are doing this and they found, and they realize that even though on the surface, it seems like the stories are similar, but when you get into the details, it's completely different in the sense that, again, I'm not a great expert, maybe someone here can help me, but I'm not a great expert, but the point here is that the floods in the other cultures are somehow related to the, are, are basically random. In other words, it's not a moral story. You have the gods and the gods are upset at each other. So they bring the floods. It's not a moral story. Also the person who saved, usually the king who saved or whoever is saved is saved really by chance. Not because he's a moral character, but something works out and he is being saved. This is very different than the Torah story, which is from the beginning to the end emphasizes that the reason and the cause for the destruction was a moral one. The reason for Noah's selection is not because somehow the nepotism, he has some, some uh, connection, like we said, you may think when it says Noah finds grace in the eyes of the Lord, the last verse of last Parsha, but then quick, very quickly in this Parsha, Noah clear, clearly states Noah was a righteous man and it becomes a moral story. And that is also the takeaway from the story that there's reward and punishment and there's divine intervention. And in that sense, seeing how the similarities with the, with the surrounding areas and seeing how the Torah tells the story differently highlights the theme of what the Torah is trying, trying, trying to tell us. Sometimes we get distracted by all the animals and the zoo and the excitement that we miss the overarching story. And the overarching story, of course, is the morality of it all. So that is just by way of introduction, um, just so we don't have to actually read the we, did, we, we get into the details. No, I'm kidding. Okay, so we, there, are, there, are, there are a few themes that we were discussing sort of simultaneously. Last week, we discussed the different names of God, Hashem, Elohim, chapter six and chapter seven. But I want to go back a little bit because there's another theme that we mentioned earlier also, um, but we mentioned earlier, but we didn't really fully get into it. And that is the spiritual interpretation of this entire story, which the Hasidim are very interested in because we like the story that we understand that the Torah is, is uh, everlasting in a sense, not just that the moral lesson is everlasting, but in some sense, everything in the Torah has an equivalent in the life of every, of every person. And we discussed this at some length. We said that we have the, the Teva, the Ark. We said the word for Ark in Hebrew is the word, words of Torah and prayer. And when we have the waters, we have the challenges of life, um, the we suppose we we God is telling us we should retreat to the to we should retreat to the to the harmony of the words of Torah study and prayer, and that's where we find our protection. And that's we said that was the teaching of the Baal Shem Tov, Teva being word. And then we said also that Rabbi Shneir Zalman adds a very interesting and um, um, detailed but important detail that just like in the story, the 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 waters of the flood lift up the ark. So too, the challenges actually intensify your connection to God. Because ironically, when a person senses the distance, the distance creates the yearning. So that's what we discussed in the past. So that's one way of reading the entire arc that the entire arc is really telling us, if you look at the dimensions of the arc and other things, you can see how to become closer to God. And I just wanna give a little sample of something that, that the Rebbe taught. One of my favorite um, teachings of the Rebbe. So I wanted to try to get in and out, do it in a few minutes. Um, some of you heard it from me already, but uh, it's always good to hear it again. It's good for me to hear it again. 
And that is, we know that uh, I, we also look, we also look at Rashi's interpretation because the Rebbe, ever since his mother passed away in 1964, every time he taught Torah on Shabbat, he would always focus on a Rashi and, 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 and uh, analyze the Rashi and, get, and then give a spiritual interpretation of the Rashi. So here we're gonna do a case in point. Um, if you look back at chapter six, verse 16, so we're talking about the dimensions of the ark in verse 15, right? If it's in our scroll, page 31. So this is how you should make it in verse 15. 300 cubits, the length of the ark, 50 cubits, it's width, and 30 cubits, it's height. We discussed a little bit what the Cleocra says about that, 15, with the number 15 hiding there. And then you have verse 16. But verse 16 in the English is not going to help us because the English translates, the English takes sides. That's the problem with the English translation. It takes sides. It says, a window shall you make for the ark and to a cubit finish it from above. Put the entrance of the ark in its side, make it with bottom, second and third decks. Okay, we're gonna focus on the beginning. So hard to answer that about a window you shall make to the ark. What, this is how they translate it. In Hebrew, it doesn't say a window. In fact, what it says is so hard. So hard means light. Um, you may know the word so hard, is obviously other words for, for, for light, like or, right? Or is light. What is tsohar? But if you know in, in Hebrew, afternoon is tsaharayim, right? Tsaharayim is plural for light. I guess in the evening, in the afternoon, there's a plenty of light. So you have, you have um, tsaharayim is lights. That's really what, what the etymology of afternoon. If you say tsaharayim tovim, good afternoon, it's tsohar plural. Tsohar means light. If you look at the art scroll in 16, and the, um, page 31 at the bottom of the page, second to last comment, it says as follows, it quotes Rashi. Some say it was a skylight. According to most commentators, it was a window Noah opened after the flood. And some say it was a precious stone that refracted the outside lights to illuminate the interior, and that's Rashi. So we have two interpretations of what this light is. We know Noah has light. Um, what we don't know is what type of light it was. And Rashi therefore gives two, 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 two possibilities. One possibility is that it's a window and the other po possibility is a precious stone. Okay, very simple, very simple Rashi. But nothing is simple once you start analyzing it like it ever loved to do. And I'm, I don't wanna just give you all the, the sort of the Talmudic analysis. I'm gonna do that as well. But the point here is to get to the spiritual interpretation because everything has to be brought down into the practical sense. So, um, why do we have why do we have two interpretations, and what is the superiority to each of to each of them? Um, the problem. Let's start with the problems. The premise is as follows: The Rebbe taught this premise. The Rebbe, when the Rebbe taught Rashi over the years, he set out um, rules. Is that a right word, right word? Yeah, rules. Rules for Rashi interpretation. And one of the rules is that whenever you have two interpretations, um, it's because there's a certain problem with the first interpretation. And that's why we bring the second interpretation. Nevertheless, the first interpretation is superior to the second interpretation. In other words, the problem on the second interpretation is greater than the problem on the first interpretation. Does that make sense? If the first interpretation would be um, complete, then you don't need a second one. Right, because the way we look at Rashi, it's not just Rashi bringing random interpretations. If you open up the Medrash, every Rashi, every word has multiple common commentaries. Rashi doesn't just pick two, he picks one. If he picks two, it's because there's a problem with the first, the second one helps. Sometimes Rashi brings three, and that becomes even more interesting that the first two are not enough, you have to have a third one, but that's more complicated than right now. Okay, so let's, let's start, let's see why the first interpretation is better, and yet it has a question. And yet we bring a second one, therefore, yet the question on the second one is, is, is stronger than the first one. So you make a skylight for the Teva, make a skylight for the Ark. The problem with saying it's a skylight or a window, really, so our Russian says, yes, I'm going to say it's a window. The problem with the window is that you have a very big structure. You have a structure that's 300 by 50. Um, how much, and more than that, it's also set up as, as with compartments. Where did we read the compartments? We read the compartments in verse, the verse 14. 
right? 14, make for yourself the ark of gopher wood, make the ark of compartments. Okay, so you have many compartments, right? What does one skylight help in a building, in a structure with many compartments? You may help for one room, but what about everything else? So what's the, what would be the function of having a window for light if it's not really gonna provide light? It doesn't say many windows. So obviously, Noah had to, the Rebbe talks about this, other interpretations say Tzor means oil. Obviously, Noah had oil there to produce light. But what is one skylight going to do for you? That's why, that's why, that's why the, the interpretation as Tzohar, as skylight, that's the weakness of that interpretation. Okay, so what do we have? As, what, so what does the second interpretation do for us? The second interpretation says, look, you have a precious stone. And a precious stone is very interesting because so assume you have a candle and the candle is in the center of every compartment. The precious stone reflects the candle light and then you could shine it like a flashlight to the all corners of the room. And the, the beauty of the precious stone is that it's mobile, right? He can, Noah can carry it wherever he goes. And, and, and in that sense, the fact that there are many compartments and only one source of light is okay because the source of light is not built into the ark. The source of light is mobile. So that's why the second interpretation is better than the first interpretation. In other words, it solves the problem of why one light would be enough. Okay. What's so, so then stick with the first interpretation. What's the weakness with the second interpretation? So the weakness with the second interpretation is that if you look at the verse 16, it says, Sohar ta'ase You should make a, a light. They translate it for the ark. Really, it's to the ark, which sounds like you're building it into the ark. Make it to the ark. If I say bring a flashlight to the ark, bring a precious stone to the ark, you don't say, make it within the ark. You just say, bring, bring, bring a precious stone. So the fact that, that the verse says, make it into the ark, that makes it difficult to say that it is a precious stone, which is not built in. And that's why the first interpretation is superior because the first interpretation says what? The first interpretation says it's a window built into the ark. Okay, so now I gave you the, the, the Talmudic analysis of why the first interpretation is incomplete. We have a second. The second one is also incomplete. We have the first, but the first one is superior because the language of the verse. Beautiful. This is the type of thing you'd have to do every Shabbos. Now the question becomes, why can't you just be clear? The Torah should say skylight or stone, and you solve the problem. And then I, we would just say 15 minutes instead of getting together at 8.30 in the morning and Sunday morning, trying to figure out if it's a skylight or a precious stone. Say skylight or precious stone, and you solve the problem. So for this, you need to get to the spiritual, the Kabbalistic interpretation. And the Kabbalistic interpretation is that when we talk about our own spiritual art, we need to bring light. And we need a skylight and a precious stone. And we need a skylight first, and we need a precious stone second. And that's why the Torah is intentionally vague. Because in addition to the simple interpretation, where, where it was one or the other, in the spiritual interpretation, it's both. And it's specifically in this order. First, first precious, first skylight, and then precious stone, and that's somehow a symbol of how we are supposed to serve God. Okay, so that now this opens up a whole other line of thinking, and here we go. But so far, any questions? If there's no questions, we continue. All good. Okay. So what is the difference between you? So we're in our ark. We're in our ark. What's the difference between opening up a skylight to the sky, or having a precious stone? So from the Kabbalistic perspective, it's as follows. The question becomes, how does one have a relationship with God within this world? This world, as we discussed many times, we also had it in the JLI recently, recently the word for world, the word for olam is helem, is concealment. By definition, the, def the idea of a physical world is a place where you don't see God. Another question is, so how do I have a relationship with God in a place where God is hidden? So there are really two possibilities. And First, we start with the first, and then when you grow, you can get to the second. The first is that occasionally something miraculous happens. It could be miraculous on the scale of the Exodus, miracles that defy, defy history. But it could also be on a smaller scale. When something happens and you feel something good happens that's unexpected, and you feel that God is helping you um, in an unexpected way, you, that's how you feel close to God. In simple Kabbalistic language, that would mean you're opening up a window. In other words, the ark is concealment. You need the spiritual light, which represents the light of God. So you have to open up 
a hole within nature and realize and see and recognize the divine intervention that happens occasionally. In other words, recognize the miracles in your life. And if you don't see any, it's because you're not opening up a window, right? They're always there, but you have to look for them. So you have to open up the window and you have to recognize the miracles. Okay, that's the first interpretation. Then we get to a more interesting interpretation. The more interesting interpretation is the second step. The second step is you have a precious stone. What is the definition of a precious stone? The precious stone is you're not bringing light from the outside. The stone is something physical and something physical, but it can reflect light. What is the, sec what, what is the, what is the meaning of the second interpretation? Second interpretation is when somebody grows to the point where they recognize that nature itself could reflect the divine light. In other words, nature itself is a creation of God. Nature itself tells you the glory of God. So again, first interpretation is you want to feel close to God. You can't feel close to God in nature because in nature, God is concealed. So you have to look for those times where you have divine intervention, where the unexpected happens. And then you say, ah, now I feel close to God. And that's the first interpretation because that's the easier thing to, to achieve. Then you get to the deeper interpretation. The deeper inter interpretation is, oh, you want to bring light into your ark. You can realize that the precious stone, the physicality itself, the laws of nature themselves reflect the greatness of God. And that's the second interpretation. Make sense? Okay. So that's how we have the two interpretations of Rashi, explaining it in the spiritual sense. And how, if you read it in the spiritual sense, both the interpretations are relevant. And you move from the first to the second, which explains why the Torah is vague to begin with, because the Torah wants to tell you that there are two steps and it's two ways to get to where we need to be, which is to sense the divine light into this world, in the world. Okay, fine. That's all by way of introduction. I'm going back and talking about the spirituality. And now we're going to um, continue in our exploration of the text, provided I can pull out my notes. Rabbi, is the implication of those two interpretations that the second one is, is deeper than the first? Because yes. it, seems yes. to me the, it seems to me the opposite. I mean, okay. again, in all these flood stories in other cultures, uh, the accentuation is that the flood was uh, that God is the, the God of nature. And, you know, uh, the Judaism changes that and says that God is not only the God of nature, but has is a God of so much more. Correct. So in, Correct. in the second interpretation where the the stone is reflecting, again, the, the natural attributes of God, it would seem to be less relevant or less significant. Right. So, so I just want to clarify a little bit, and this is, relates to this is a very this is a this is a this relates to a little bit about what we spoke on Friday. That from the Hasidic perspective, of course, what the Rebbe was saying was was influenced by the Hasidic perspective. The Hasidic perspective is that it is we're looking for unity, and if you're looking for unity, then ultimately God and nature cannot conflict. Of course, nature is. God is, 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 is God transcends nature. That's a that's 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 a that's a premise in Judaism. However, nature itself, ultimately, when you look at nature, what do you see? Do you see concealment? And then you need a miracle to break nature and tell you, oh, God is still in control despite nature? Or is nature itself telling the glory of God, like King David says in the book of Psalms, which we say it every Shabbos, Psalm 19, for example, but there are many other examples. Hashemaim is Saprim Kvod El the heavens declare the glory of God, okay? Now he says, I lift up my eyes to the heaven and see the glory of God, et cetera, et cetera. So you can get to the space uh, and you can grow spiritually to the space where you see that, that of course, nature, God, God, nature is not God. Nature is a creation of God, but nature tells the story. Nature tells you that there is a creator. So you look at a piece of art, you can get stuck at the piece of art or you can see from the piece of art that there is an artist. And this is really what we're trying to say is that the second step, once you, once you, once you learn to think, once you break out of the, mo the mold that tells you that nature is the only thing there is, is what nature tells you. And you understand there's a light that transcends nature. And occasionally that light, you open up a window within nature and you see that what, that is, that what is transcending um, nature. Once you understand that something transcends nature, then you say, okay, so now what is nature? What is the conflict between the transcending, the transcendence and, 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 and the natural reality? And in some, some perspectives, it's a, it's a constant, it's a constant a battle between creation and, creation and creator. But Judaism says, no, it's not a battle because 
that ultimately the laws of nature themselves are a way that God expresses himself. So the deeper, the deeper, so the, if you're right, the first step is you have to break, make a hole with the nature and see the transcendence. That's opening up a light. But then you get, once you understand that there is transcendence, then you could see, okay, so now we have to reinterpret if God indeed transcends, transcends nature and nature is not everything. So what is nature? So what is it? So here we get to the, dip, to, to, to the deeper point where, I don't want to say deeper, it's a more interesting one because here you sense the unity. The unity is that even in something that doesn't seem to be telling the glory of God, you discover that it is telling the glory of God. So you find the truth in the unexpected. Ultimately, that's more interesting. That's why I say it's superior. It's superior because ultimately, that we spoke about this on Friday, if you have unity, the, when the multiplicity, when the, when, the, when the multiplicity declares the unity, the uni unity is much deeper, philosophically speaking, right? If you have one because there's only one creation and everybody, right? If, 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 there's, only one, if there's only God and everyone, and, and there's only one is because there's only God is one thing, it's true, but it's one thing. But if you have a world of multiplicity and every aspect of the multiplicity declares the glory of God, then you have the multiplicity sharing the oneness. That is the true oneness. And that's why I mean when I say it's deeper. So I hope Thanks. that at least makes a little bit sense. Rabbi, what was the, the word I missed, that the Hebrew word for, oh. that has double meaning? Maybe that's the key because that intends to be both. Yeah, so it's Sohar. Sohar is 16, uh, uh, um, chapter 6, verse 16. So I'm looking now at the Aramaic translation. Unculus, he indeed translates it, not light. He translates it, Nehor. Nehor. Nehora is light. He translates it, uh, but the way, the way that what the word means, light, light. You make light for the ark. Question is, how do I make light for the ark? Answer, option one, the window. Option two, precious stone. What's the difference? One, I have to open up nature, allow the transcendent light to enter, beautiful. And it, then, then, then the um, step stage two is if you could say nature itself, like I said, nature itself is expresses God. And that's a good point. It's not God, it, but it expresses the glory of God. So the point is both. Is it the same word that we use for Zor? Is the book of Kabbalah or is it a different spelling? It's a different spelling, but but it's related. Zohar, it's a different, it's a different, it's a different, it's a different spelling. Zohar is similar to light, but it really means like radiance. It's a little bit different than Sohar. Um, but they're related. Two or three letters are the same and they sound the same. But I don't think it's the exact same word. I think they're related. Thank you. Okay, just a cute little, a cute little. A cute little anecdote, a cute little detail. And again, just to reiterate what we said in the past is that chapter six, we read about the, the flood from the perspective of Elohim. Elohim is the God of the, 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 the attribute of justice. And in chapter six, only therefore only mentions that you'll have two speed, two animals from every, in other words, two appear of every species, just two, just male and female. Because the attribute of justice, you just have to save the bare minimum just to allow the biology to continue. Chapter seven introduces the name Hashem, Bayomer Hashem Lenoach. Hashem speaks to Noach, the beginning of chapter seven. And there, we all of a sudden, we see kindness. We also see seven, the pure animals, the clean animals, there are seven, and that represents holiness. And that represents that there's, a, there's a, also Noah is gonna use some of those animals to bring offerings to God. It's much more than just a biologic, biologi biological um, survival. So there's a cute observation that the Talmud makes. The Talmud explains it a little bit differently, but the observation is still there. If you look at, I'll read it, if you don't have the book, but I'll read it. Um, I'm just reading, for example, on page 33 in the Art Scroll, chapter 6, verse 19. 
Okay, so we have, and from all that lives of all flesh, two of each shall you bring into the ark to keep alive with you. They shall be male and female. Zacharun Keva, male and female. That's verse 19. On the same page, once you go to verse chapter seven, and we talk about the um, idea that we bring seven animals from the pure animals. And all of a sudden, you're going to look at verse two, and it actually is pretty funny. Of every clean animal taken to, into you, seven peers, a male with its mate. Ah, they killed it in English. And of its animal that is not clean, two, a male with its mate. Okay, they killed it. What is, how do you say it in Hebrew? This is funny. I'm almost laughing. Of every clean animal, take unto you seven peers, ish ishto, man and his wife. And of the animal that is not clean, two, male with its, not male with its mates, not male, I don't know what they are, man with its wife. In other words, chapter six refers to the animals as biological creatures, male, female. Chapter seven re refers to the animals and gives them personality. It doesn't say male, female, it says man and its wife. And the term wife in Hebrew, isha or ish, it re re refers to the concept of ishut. Ishut is betrothal, marriage. It's much deeper than the biological connection. It represents that there's sort of an emotional connection between the animals. So what's happening here? It's funny. So Rash, the Talmud gives its own interpretation. The Talmud says that which at, the Talmud says that 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 e, before the flood, even the and the whole earth became corrupt because because humanity became corrupted, and therefore the animals themselves became corrupted in the sense that they did not cleave to their own species. And therefore, the only ones that were saved were the ones that cleave to their species. That's man and his wife, the ones that were loyal to their to their to their spouse. That's the Talmud interpretation. But the more Kabbalistic interpretation is that it's consistent with the overarching point here. The overarching point here is that once we introduced chapter seven, we we were looking at um, the creation from the perspective of the name of compassion, which is much more than just thinking about the world in the sense of survival, in the sense of biology, then we understand that not only that God has compassion on the people, but God also has compassion on the animals because he senses, in other words, we're, we're, we're paying tribute to the, I don't want to say, uh, how do I say this, to the personality of the animals, and therefore it refers to the animals as man and wife instead of male and female. So if you have animals, um, you may like this interpretation, but it, even, even if you don't, it's interesting that, that it's, it's so clear, not only the kosher animals, but even the unclean animals in chapter seven, verse two, become ishvi ishto, become man and, his, man and his wife instead of male and female. So that's just a, a little observation here. We also continue a little bit and we think about the concept of how we talk about okay let's look a little further and and we look at verse six and verse verse seven so in verse in verse let's start, let's start actually let's start with verse seven chapter one then hashem said to noah come to the ark you and all your household for it is you that i have seen to be righteous before me in this generation if I read verse six, verse um, chapters seven, verse one, the verse I just read, what impression that do I get? Bo el hateva, come to the ark. What does that sound like? The flood is happening very soon. Every morning you wake up in the morning, you turn on the weather, and you want to know if it's going to rain. Thank you, Mark, for the background with the thunder and the lightning. It puts us in the mood of the flood here, because here I'm sitting in we're sitting in the middle of the summer and the spring. We don't we don't feel like the flood, but in any case. You wake up in the morning, you want to know what's the temp, what, what's the weather. So God tells Noah, come to the ark. Come to the ark means we're starting the flood. The excitement happens. So I'm, I'm already gearing up. I'm ready for the flood to start immediately. But what happens over here is chapter seven. But then you skip, you read a, few, a little bit more. It says, take all the animals. And then you get to, to verse four. Why should you come to the flood today? You ready? Come to the flood. Why should you come to the ark today? Um, for in seven more days time i will send rain upon the earth 40 days and 40 nights and i will blot out all existence that i have made from upon the face of the ground okay come to the flood today why because we're leaving in seven days so i don't know what happens when you go on a cruise do you have to come seven days early maybe you could say no i had a lot of packages to schlep you have to have food you have to bring the tuna sandwiches for a whole year but in any case it is a little bit strange what is what's the seven day period what happens in seven days so we have rashi 
And Rashi says as follows. Rashi says, Rashi does the math. I wonder if they have it in the English here. Yeah, they have it in the English uh, and, our, and the art scroll on page 33, um, chap, uh, verse um, comment four. For in seven more days, after the original period that God allotted the people to, uh, for repentance, his mercy decreed that he give them seven additional days. That's one interpretation. In other words, yeah, God says, come to the flood, come to the ark, because now is when the flood is supposed to come. But then he says, you know what? Let's do another week. So that extra week is is indica indication of God's kindness, which would be consistent with the overarching point of this chapter that it's Hashem talking. Hashem is, is, even when Hashem punishes, it's motivated by the attribute of mercy. In any case, that's the first interpretation. What is the second interpretation? Alternatively, these were the seven days of mourning for Mitu Shalach, who had just died, in whose honor God delayed the flood. So we read in the, at the end of Genesis that the Mitu Shalach is one of the descendants of, in other words, the, 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 one of the descendants of Cain, an ancestor of Noah, and he dies exactly on the day. God won't bring the flood until Metushalach passes away in the honor of Metushalach. He dies the day the flood is supposed to start. So the Medrash says, look, God says, you know, let's wait a week because we'll have the seven day mourning period for Metushalach, the righteous Metushalach, and therefore he's going to delay the flood. And Rashi quotes, he says as follows, I never did the math. Rashi says, go out and do the math and you and count the years of Metushalach and you will see that Metushalach passes away. Metushalach's years end on the, the year that, on the, time, on the day that Noah turns 600. And you'll see in next verse, Noah was 600 years old in verse, I'm sorry, not two verses down. In verse six, it says Noah, um, and Noah was 600 years old when the flood was water upon the earth. So another is Metushalach, who lives, I think, 969 years or something like that. He dies that, if you do the math, he's, he passes away on the, on the day that Noah turns 600. We wait an extra seven day period in order to give Noah the, in order to give, in order to give honor to Metushalach. So that's very nice. Why do I have to, very nice. But I saw an interesting interpretation of the Kliyakar who I love. He says like this, he says that both of these interpretations of Rashi are related. What, what were the two interpretations of Rashi? First interpretation is that we're waiting seven days to give people time to repent. Second interpretation, it's the seven day Shiva period. Now, could we put these two interpretations together? Says, Ra, says the Kliyakar, the best time to repent is to, there's the Shiva. When you think about the passing of a person, makes you think about the mortality of man, makes you think about what the purpose of life is. And like King Solomon says, it's better to go to a house of a mourning than to go to a house of a wedding because in the house of a mourning is when a person really thinks about the meaning of life. So God wants to give people a time to repent, the generation a time to repent. So God says, according to the Kliyakar, if they're not gonna repent in the seven day period of Metushalach, they never will. In other words, you connect, we're connecting these two interpretations at the seven day of mourning period, it would, would have been the perfect, the perfect time to create that awareness and repentance, and when that fails, then like I said, even, even the name Hashem, even the name compassion says, uh, it's not compassionate to let them continue, we have to bring the flood. So that's just a, a point about that seven, that seven day, that seven day period. Isn't the implication there that Metushalach was, a, was an honorable, amazing fellow, lived the longest of any other biblical fellow, and here we let him die off, and we have this guy, Og, clinging to the ark and living for millennium right so the og is the og is more the more medrash it's not um, it's not the simple interpretation simple interpretation doesn't really say that noah survived the flood that og survived the flood that's that's the medrash and that's verse that, that's based on a verse that appears for uh, that appears in next week's parsha the next in the next parsha but the point here is that yes the fact that og pass that metushelach passes away in peace that is a sign of righteousness where else do you see it you see it when God talks to, to Abraham at the covenant between the parts. And he says that you should know that your descendants will be slaves for 400 years. And then they'll come back and I'll take them out with great wealth, etc. cetera, the covenant between the parts. What does he say? Well, there God says, You're gonna to return to your parents. That's, a, that's, a, uh, uh, that's a, an expression of passing away. 
you will return to your parents with peace. In other words, yes, the Jewish people are going to experience trial and tri trials and tribulations in the with the exodus, with the with the exile. But you yourself are not going to experience it. You're going to be able to to pass away in peace, and that is a great blessing. And in a sense, if you ask Metushelach, would you rather be pass? Would you rather pass away in peace, 969 years old, and uh, or would you rather be clinging on to the to the to the flood to the to the to the ark? I don't know what Metushelach would say. No, but I'm serious. I'm, I'm I'm saying if you look at if you look at if you look at the biblical if you look at 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 the the other stories in the Bible, you see that there's a there's a blessing in passing away in peace. I always think about you know there's some of I always think about when I, uh, this is just a personal thing. I don't know. You talk about certain you know um, um, people, famous personalities who pass away. And when do they pass away? When do they live? You read their commentaries. You want to know when would they live? To me, the most interesting people are not interesting. I always think about this when you read about, for example, the Raghuchava. Raghuchava was a great a great Talmudic scholar passed away in 1930s, and he passed away in 1930s in, in Poland. And you ask yourself, it's like, it's a blessing to pass away. Some people I know passed away in 1939 in, in Poland, right? You say, in, in some sense, that's a great blessing. In some sense, a great blessing. Why do I have to go there? My grandmother passed away at, uh, I should know this, right? 97, maybe even older. I, I, I just, it skips my mind. She passed away, I think 90, 98 maybe even, and she passed away like a month before COVID, okay? Now, in a sense, it was a blessing because all her family was there with her. I went to visit her, everybody went to visit her. If she passed away a few weeks later, she would got, uh, unfortunately pass away alone, right? So it's a great blessing that a person could pass away in peace, especially if they live a long life and a meaningful life. And, 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 that's, and, that, and in, in some sense, that's a blessing and that's an honor and that's and, and Metushalach, so that's, that's a sign that, of Metushalach's righteousness. And um, that's how I see it. Maybe I'm wrong. A Noach, Noach, Noach is saved, but you don't want to be in his shoes either. You read post the flood, Noach needs a lot of therapy. And the problem is he didn't get any therapy and he has trauma. And uh, that trauma surfaces very quickly. So surviving the flood is, uh, is not an easy task. And Mr. Shalach passes away before the flood. It's a sign of he lived his life. He had a good life. He lived a righteous life and he passes away. Is he the one who's able to rebuild a new world? Probably not. Noah is more flawed, but but that's that's that it, he he's it's left to him to try to rebuild. Um, the trauma exactly that we're, that he has to experience that we're going to have to deal with later because we're not going to get to it in the next in today. Okay, a little comment about the age. Noah was six hundred years old, and Noah. Um, Noah was 600 years old when the flood was upon the earth. How do you say a person is at a certain age in Hebrew? Literally, in Hebrew, if you translate it literally, you say Noah was the son of 600 years. You say Ben Kamata, how old are you? So the, you say Ben Kamata, the son of how much are you? Very strange way of saying it. There's even a joke. I don't want to say who they say the joke about because it's not nice, but they say, Okay, I hope this is gonna go over well. I'm gonna to try to translate the joke. So this, we're talking about, an, it's an Israeli figure. I'm not gonna name him because I don't want, he already passed away, but it's trying to say how alienated he was from religion. So he comes to Shul and they wanna honor him. So they give him an aliyah. So they say, Yamod, come up, come up to get an aliyah. So they say, Yamod, what's your name? So I don't know, I'm just gonna say a name. Uh, my name, okay, I'm gonna give it away. Whatever, I'm gonna throw a name, yeah, Yaakov. Okay, Yaakov. They say, Yaakov Ben. What's Ben? The son of. Who's your, what's your father's name? So he says, Ben. He says, Ben? Ben, he thinks it means, like in Hebrew, how old are you? So he says, Ben Arbaim, I'm 40. So they say, no, 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 your father. He says, my father? My father's 80. <laughs> right? You missed the point. Because in Hebrew, in modern Hebrew, Ben means not, Ben is how old are you? But really, if you think about it, Ben is, you're the son of. So what does it mean, Noah is the son of 600 years? It's very strange. <laughs> Reminds me of my grandfather's joke. Who they would ask him, the grandkids would ask him, "How old are you?" And he would say, "I have no idea. It changes every year." So, so here the point here is, what does it mean that in the Hebrew you are the son of six hundred years? Now, the son, by the way, Ben. So, so, so it's a very interesting concept, and this ties into the idea of why Judaism says you have to honor the elder, regardless of the the elder's um, um, a state of righteousness or state of wisdom, just if a person, 
if a person is, is an elderly person, you have to honor that person um, regardless. Why? Because we understand that a person who lives long, there is a built-in acquisition of experience and knowledge. So if I'm 600 years old, I am the product. I am the son of 600 years. Now you can't compare the some person who's a product of 600 years or 700 years to a kid who's a product of 18 years, right? He may be he may be smart. He may be he may, he may be he, he may be a, a prodigy. But you're, you're you're the product of 18 years. You don't have that experience, and that's how you see that within the language. The language itself um, of Hebrew highlights and expresses the attitude toward old old age toward age so we're not saying oh this guy's an old person we say no this person is a product of all this time if you're the product of all that time you have something that other people don't have somebody once said that uh, uh they wanted to to uh describe what a millennial is and they say the person who's writing an autobiography at 18 Right, you're 18 years old. What are you writing? Right? Oh, I have some. I have a lot to say. I experience a lot. You're 18. What are you writing? So no, you can write your autobiography when you're when you're when you're 600. Of course, you live longer than that. But here, the point is that's how we see a day. That's how we see the passage of time. The passage of time is what forms the person, and that's why you're not going to say Noach lived. Noach was six. Noach lived. Till the, by the way, till this point, usually you say. Up to this point, the reason why the comment, I'm commenting here, because up to this point, we don't have Noah was 500 years old. Usually, usually it says, no, the person lived, whatever, 1,700 years, whatever it says. And he lived 100 years and gave birth. He lived five, 800 years and died. Here is the first time, I think, where it says Noah was 600 years old. Again, the son of 600 years old. Son of means the product. And because the soul, the experiences that the soul, that the person, the person accumulates is really what forms the person. And that is what makes the person um, who the person is. So that is just a little bit about how we think about, about age. Let's think about the concept of 40 days and 40 nights. We like the number 40, everything in, in, in Judaism, when you see a round number, you know, you see a number, it's, it's going to tell you something. The 40 is interesting. So this is indication to what the, Kab the Kabbalah says and what we're going to talk about hopefully later that the way we think of the flood is not just a way of destruction. If God wants to destroy the world, there are much easier ways to do it. He can send, uh, he can send an asteroid. I don't know what he can do. He can be he can send a pandemic to make it rain for 40 days and 40 nights and then make it flood for a full year. It's a, it's a, it's a lot of, it's a big mess. There's, there's more efficient ways to get rid of people. Um, so the Kabbalah says, look, the number, the rain represents the flood, represents purity. And the idea of the flood, the punishment is not just to punish and get rid of the bad, even though it did that as well. But what we're trying to say, we're trying to say is that the flood represents bringing down purity into this world. And we'll talk about it. And that changes everything. That changes why there will, there will no longer be a flood in the world because the, even the forces of unholiness have been weakened by the flood. And thus, the, even the forces of unholiness can be transformed and do not have to be utterly destroyed. I mean, of course, there are pockets of evil that has to be utterly destroyed. But, over, but overall, evil could be transfor, tra transformed. It doesn't have to be destroyed. That is a product of the waters that represents the divine purity. Now, if you're thinking of it in that sense, 40 represents purity. It represents multiple things, but, but in the context of, of purity, we know that, that if you, the law is about a mikvah, that a mikvah needs 40 sa'ah, sa'ah is a certain measurement of water, and it needs 40 sa'ah of water to, to create the purity. So the 40 days correspond to the 40 sa'ah of the mikvah. That's another indication that the waters are supposed to be purifying waters. That is one, that is, uh, one interpretation. Um, but again, that doesn't really explain why 40. Why does the mikvah need 40 sa'ah? So if you look throughout the Bible, you will see that 40, from the perspective of Judaism, 40 is the number that it takes to create something new. One place you see it clearly is, <clears throat> is Moses at the end of his life when he talks about they're about to go into Israel, the last day of his life. And he says, you know, up to this point, you sinned, um, but it wasn't really your fault. And he says, God did not give you a heart to know, eyes to see, and ears to hear until this day. What does that mean? What does that mean? So the Talmud explains, quotes this verse and says, you don't really understand the wisdom you learn until you're 40 years old. 
in the language of the Talmud, a person does not really understand the wisdom of his teacher until he's 40 years old. In other words, 40 is the number where it takes to sort of internalize something and really transform. The Talmud also says that it takes 40 days from the moment of conception until the fetus is formed and formed as a male or female. That's why the Talmud says that you can pray for the gender of a child up to 40 days because it, it wasn't yet formed. After 40 days, if a person's wife is pregnant and he says, I wish for God, please um, give me a son or give me a daughter, that the Talmud said, the Mishnah says is tefillat shav, it's a, it's, a false, it's a false prayer because it's too late, it already happened. And prayer, you're supposed to pray for the future, not for the past. So I'm not sure about the science, maybe Bob will tell us, Bob is here, Bob can tell us what we know about the 40th day of conception. But the point here is from the perspective of the sages, 40 is when transformation happens. Moses is on the mountain, of course, 40 days and 40 nights, because here you have to internalize the divine wisdom. Everything that takes internalization, creation of a new entity takes 40 days. And therefore the transformation of the world through the waters of the flood from a place of unholiness to a place of purity also takes the 40 days and 40 nights. And that's, and that's the significance of 40. Now, a very interesting, a very interesting uh, subtle observation that Rashi already makes. If you look at page 35 in the Arts Gold, chapter 7, verse, verse 10. Page 35, chapter 7, verse 10. It just keeps jumping back and forth from flood to rain. Right. If you look at verse 10, for example, and it came to pass after the seven day period that the waters of the flood were upon the earth. OK. Um, verse 12. And the rain was upon the earth 40 days and 40 nights. That's verse 12. Rain was it rained for 40 days and 40 nights. If you go to verse 17 on that same page in the art school, 17, when the flood was on the earth 40 days, the waters increased. So that period of the 40 day rain is referred to both at, with the term rain as well as with the term flood. And the question becomes, was it rain or was it flood? And we understand that flood is destruction, is destruction and rain is a sign of blessing. So what was it? Was it, um, <clears throat> was it rain or was it a flood? So here we see what Rashi says as follows. Rashi says, that in the beginning, verse 12 represents the beginning, 12. Verse 12 says, and the rain was upon the earth. When it started raining, it started raining as rain. Because God says, you know, maybe I'm going to start raining. And maybe the people are going to see it's starting to rain. And the moment of truth has arrived. And maybe that will cause them to repent. Yet when God saw that they're not repenting, that's when he says what? That's when he says, that's when he says, you know what? That's when I'm going to bring the flood. In other words, they begin as waters of rain and they're transformed to the waters of flood. That's the interpretation of Rashi, which is a fine interpretation, but it's still not perfect because why isn't it perfect? Because according to Rashi, only the first day of the 40 days of rain, right? When God saw that they're not repenting, the, the rain was transformed to, to, to the flood. So Rashi's interpretation is not perfect. And here again, you get to the Kabbalistic and Hasidic interpretation. And what they say is that what these verses are telling you is that the water, the flood has two dimensions to it. On one pers from one perspective, the water is destruction for to, to wipe out the wicked. And that's why you can refer to the waters as waters of flood. Uh, of Mabul. Mabul is more than a flood. Mabul means, Mabul means, means to confuse everything. It's waters of destruction. It's waters of chaos. On the other hand, that same water, if you look at it from another perspective, if you look at it from another perspective, it's waters of rain, it's waters of blessing. In other words, it also brings about the purification of the world. So in other words, by the Torah jumping back and forth, referring to it as waters of destruction or waters of, of waters of the flood and destruction or waters of rain and blessing, it's telling you like everything else in life, the two sides to the coin and some things could be either destruction or, or purity depending on your perspective. And the, I guess, depending if you're in the ark or out the ark, but this is a deeper lesson to us. So when a challenge comes, it's um, not always in our control to, to avoid the challenge, but then the question becomes, how do I respond to the challenge? Is it just gonna be something that destroys me and drowns me 
or is it going to be something that we said earlier that will raise my ark and will be and will be an opportunity for purity that is really uh, in the eyes of that really depends on the person's receiving it whether i'm receiving a flood or receiving rain of blessing so that's again indicating indicate an indication for the double the double dimension of 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 the flood Okay, I don't want to track it right now, but if you read if you read verse verse seven, you see that the, that the Torah is building up the description of how. See, the problem is not a problem. There's a lot of there's a lot of description of exactly how the flood takes place and how it and how it grows. And you say, why do I need to know this? Just tell me the flood came and it covered all the mountains and that's it. You can really get the whole flood in one verse. Instead. You're really getting um, verse from verse 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, even 24 of chapter seven, sort of building up what the what is taking place. And the question is, why is the Torah spending so much time? Just say it rained, it flooded, it covered everybody, and everyone died, and move on. So it's possible that the Torah is trying to give us this feeling, the, the, the feeling it didn't happen in one sense. In other words, how would you feel if you're on the ark? If you're on the ark and you're experiencing it like Noah experiences it, he didn't experience it in one verse. It took time. In other words, it took time and, it's, and, 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 it, and maybe that explains the F effect that that has on Noah. So we're building it up. We're saying, you can read the verses here. I don't want to ruin your Sunday morning, but for example, verse 18, verse, verse 17 is a liftoff. Verse 17, when the flood was upon the earth 40 days, the waters increased and raised the ark so that it was lifted above the earth. The waters strengthened and increased greatly upon the earth and the ark drifted upon the surface of the waters. First, the ark just lifts off. Now it starts moving. The waters strengthened very much upon the earth and all the high mountains which are under the entire heavens were covered. 15, so in other words, now we cover the mountains. Then you say 15 cubits upward did the water strengthen and the mountains were covered. It keeps going, keeps increasing. Talks about the destruction in verse 20 and 21. Fine, we're getting this feeling of, of it's getting worse and it's increasing and ultimately everything is wiped, wiped out. And then you read the culmination is in verse 24 and the water strengthened on the earth. I'm sorry, only Noah, verse 23. So let's read the whole 23. And he blotted out all existence that was on the face of the ground from man to animal to creeping things and to the bird of the heavens and they were blotted out from the earth only Noah survived, and those were with him, and those and those with him in the ark. And the water strengthened on the earth 150 days. So for a half a year, the water is increasing, even though it didn't rain. But the water is going upward, and um, because the water is coming from the underground, I read a little bit what the what the what the uh, geologists are saying. They're saying that in that region in the world, if it's a desert region, the water does the water that it cannot be absorbed in the earth, and therefore it stays or it hangs out. And uh, that's, that's why it takes so long for it to start receding. In any case, we get to verse 8. And what does verse 8 say? And it's a very strange verse because it seems like it seems like it's almost heresy. God remembered Noah and all the beasts and all the animals that were with him in the ark. God remembered. And this, for us, we take it, I mean, in other words, for us, if it doesn't sound strange to you, it's because you heard it too many times. Because every year on Rosh Hashanah, you read the verses of remembrance that begin with this verse, God remembered Noah. God, you remembered Noah. The problem is, what does it mean God remembers Noah? Because what is the opposite? Seemingly, this is a big problem because the opposite of remembering is forgetting. And God doesn't forget or should not be able to forget. We wouldn't, we wouldn't expect God to forget. So it sounds like God says, you know what? I don't like these people. Here, I'm bringing a flood, 40 days and 40 nights. Then for 150 days, he forgot about it. He was, he was playing video games. He forgot. Then 150 days later, he says, oops, I left them, I left, I left them on the, I left them on the ark. We got to do something about it. Okay, you know what? The water will start receding. 150 days, uh, it will take 150 days for the water to recede a little bit more, but uh, approximately, and by the end of the year, they can get out of the ark. It's a very strange verse. Elohim remembered Noah. By the way, not just Noah, he also remembers the animals and the beasts. It's very interesting. It's not, it's, it's not just he remembers the human beings. He also remembers all his creations. Fascinating in the same verse. So what do we do with this verse? This strange verse of God remembering. So what we do is what we'll do, what, what the Kabbalah talks about, about Rosh Hashanah, because Rosh Hashanah, we also make a big emphasis on God remembering. 
And we talk about this every year, but we'll talk about it again because we can't not talk about it because it's a big uh, theological problem. How does God forget? So the, the, in short, what the Kabbalah says, I have about 60 seconds left. In short, what the Kabbalah says is that what is the opposite of remembering? So I misled you. I said the opposite of remembering is forgetting. And the reason why I said it is because, so I can create a question. No, the reason why I said it is because that's the common, the common understanding that the opposite of remembering is forgetting. But the Kabbalah says, no, the opposite of remembering, of course, is not forgetfulness. The opposite of remembering is insignificant. And I always tell you the story that happened with my first grade teacher, or maybe it was a second grade teacher, I don't remember who it was. But when a kid would come to class and say, I forgot my homework, and that was sort of the excuse why you should be, uh, why you should be forgiven, the teacher would say, you forgot your homework. Did you ever forget your pants? What's the point? The point is, it means it's not important to you. <laughs> it's important for you, you don't forget it. So here I did one mistake, I forgot the homework. Then I come to my teacher and I say, I want you to forgive me for that sin by doing another sin and saying that I don't really care about my homework because forgetting, forgetting means it wasn't important to me. So what does it mean that God remembers Noah? It means that the human plight becomes significant to God. Why, why is that a big deal? Why would I expect that not to happen? Because God is transcendent, because God is infinite. And if God is infinite, it's not that he forgot about the human being. It's that the human being and the plight of the human being naturally, quote unquote, naturally should be insignificant to God because the gulf between infinity and finite is too great. And that's what we're saying. What is Elohim? What is what, um, what happens over here by Yiskor Elohim at Noach? What, it, what happens here is that God remembers Noach, in other words, the, the suffering and the pain of the, and of the human experience and the human experience itself becomes significant to God. And God says, okay, we're going to intervene and we're going to help the human being. And that's really what we're doing on, on Rosh Hashanah, because Kabbalistically speaking, on Rosh Hashanah, God really questions his relationship with the earth to begin with. Does he need a relationship with the human being? And if God was, I was God consultant, I would say, you don't need it. You're infinite. Human being is finite. The struggles of the human being doesn't really matter if he comes to Shul, doesn't come to Shul, I don't mean coming to Shul. I mean, if he lives a moral life or he doesn't live a moral life, who cares? It's like the human being concerned whether the ants in the ant colony are behaving. It's not significant to you. But no, what we're saying here is, and what we pray for on Rosh Hashanah and what we evoke during the flood is that God, despite being infinite and despite really um, the, 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 human, the human condition and the condition of the animals being insignificant. Nevertheless, the big story here is God remembers. Not that God didn't forget, but now it, what, what naturally should be insignificant in the God's eyes becomes significant because God wants the relationship. Almost like the piece of art your child brought home that really is insignificant. It should not take up space on the fridge. And if it was my child, or not mine, my child, you would treat differently. But if it was anyone else's child, you wouldn't give the child the, 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 the painting, the fridge space. But if it's your child, you remember it, it's significant, you put it on the fridge, at least until the evening when the kid goes to sleep and then you throw it out. That's where the, that's where the, the analog is different, an analogy, because God uh, remembers Noah and blesses Noah. So this, ladies and gentlemen, is the story in short. Thank you for coming online. Thank you for coming in person. Uh, hopefully we'll do, continue doing the hybrid in good health. And um, the main thing is we study Torah exactly. The format is less, is less important here, there, but uh, the main thing is to keep connected. Thank you. Thank you, Rabbi. Have a, have a good week, Rabbi. Don't go anywhere. Yes. 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 So this is, this is the point, uh, a very interesting point. by Yiskar Elohim at Noach. So, so we, I commented about a little bit last week. Rashi says it. Rashi says, Zeh Hashem Midas Adin. He, this name, Elohim remembered Noah. You would expect verse eight. Okay, I don't want to get too carried with the chapters because the chapters are not a Jewish thing, but let's just go with it for convenience. Chapter six is Elohim, attribute of justice. Chapter seven is Hashem, attribute of kindness. When you get to the verse and Hashem remembered Noah, you would expect it to say Hashem, the attribute of kindness. The attribute of kindness has mercy. Instead, you're reading Elohim, the attribute of justice of the attribute of justice remembers Noah and decides to make the flood recede. And Warren's point is, that's surprising. And Rashi says the same thing. This name is the attribute of, just, of, of, of justice. Exacting justice, they're not compassion. So why, do, why does it say midat hadin? So Rashi gives you the practical answer, but, but what I said last week would also help. Rashi says, look, the prayer of the righteous could transform the attribute of justice to the attribute of compassion. 
That's the big deal here. Even justice, in other words, sometimes you have a very strict teacher. Even the strict teacher says occasionally, look, I agree, you have to give this kid a candy. That, that's, that's really what Rashi says. But based on what he explained last week on the nature of compassion, I think that it becomes even more clarified. Because what he said last week, that compassion in Hebrew, rachamim comes from the word rechem, room, and because it's giving birth, like a mother giving birth. And we said like this, that justice looks at the child or the person the way they are right now. Are you deserving? And that's fine. That's that's fear. Another way to look at another legitimate way. In other words, what compassion is doing is not saying ignore morality, ignore the person's morality. It's look at what the person could become. And occasionally the attribute of justice says agrees. He says, you know what? I agree that if you look at what humanity could become, they're deserving of forgiveness. So in that sense, the attributes are not constantly at war because People are at war when they, when they have no common ground, but really the attribute of justice and the attribute of compassion do have common ground according to the Jewish idea of compassion. They both want the same thing. They both want law and order. They both want truth. They both want uh, uh, um, keeping the rules. The question is, are we measuring on what you are now or we're measuring on your potential, what you could become? Usually attribute of justice um, demands look at the now. Occasionally the attribute of justice agrees because of the prayer of the righteous and the person, in other words, we, we, we increase the compassion in the earth and then justice it's itself says, you're right. There, it, it is just to give the person a second chance because the attribute of justice acknowledges that the potential is there and the potential could be brought out in, into reality. So that's the idea of compassion in, 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 in Judaism, um, sensing that, seeing within the person how what, what they can become. And like I said, that's what uh, your mother is supposed to do for you, right? The mother or believes in you. Why does she believe in you? She doesn't know that, 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 that you're false. Your mother knows you're false more than other people. But hopefully the mother's job is to help you become what you could become, both physically and biologically, but also spiritually and emotionally. And uh, hopefully that's the case. So that is the story in short. Thank you all. Thank you, Rowan. Thank you. Thank you very much.